Priest, Father John McDonald, will be serving on the faculty shortly. He has served as Special Assistant for Theological Affairs to the late James Cardinal Hickey, Archbishop of Washington, D.C., who was Rector of the North American College when I was a student back in the 70s. The bishop later served as the director of Calvert House, the Catholic Student Center at the University of Chicago, and as an official a, a theological consultant to the William H. Sadler Incorporated, a New York-based leading publisher in the field of Catholic religious education. He is the author of several books, and his writings on a wide range of theological and pastoral topics have appeared in various magazines and publications including the Harvard Theological Review, Theological Studies, Louvain Studies, the Irish Theological Quarterly, Chicago Studies, Origins, the New York Times, America, and Commonwealth. Bishop Braxton was ordained <coughs> the Auxiliary Bishop of St. Louis on May the 7th, 1995, and became the second Bishop of Lake Charles, Louisiana, in 2001, and he was installed as the 8th Bishop of Belleville, Illinois, in 2005. Last year, he issued his pastoral letter, The Racial Divide in the United States, a Reflection for the World Day of Peace, 2015. Since its publication in a variety of national and international journals and its presence in the, on the Internet, the bishop's pastoral letter has been widely discussed in parishes, chancery of offices, and universities around the world, and is that pastoral letter that brought his attention to us, leading to his invitation to be here today. Six days ago, on Friday, February 26, 2016, the fourth anniversary of the death of Mr. Tra Trayvon Martin in Sanford, Florida, the bishop issued a second pastoral letter, the Catholic Church and the Black Lives Matter movement, the racial divide revisited. This pastoral can be read as a continuation of his 2015 pastoral letter, which is available for sale in the bookstore here. Both pastoral letters are also available on his diocesan website. The title of his presentation to us this afternoon is The Racial Divide in the United States Revisited. So please join me in welcoming His Excellency, the Most Reverend Edward K. Braxton. Thank you, Bishop Braxton, for being with us. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much, Bishop Baker, for the kind welcome and the invitation to join you here to be a part of what is clearly a very exciting and interesting and diverse series of conversations. I only wish that I could stay longer than today, but I just returned from Los Angeles where I spoke at the Religious Education Congress and must be back in my diocese for commitments tomorrow morning. I'm very happy to be here now, though. When I was a senior at Quigley Preparatory Seminary, studying to be a priest in the Archdiocese of Chicago, I was the only person of color in my class of several hundred seminarians. A group of us saw the film version of the late Harper Lee's brilliant Pulitzer Prize winning novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. It is the story of Tom Robinson, set in Maycomb, Alabama, during the Great Depression. Tom, an upright and honest, innocent black man, is falsely accused of sexually assaulting a white woman. He is defended by an equally upright and honest white attorney, Atticus Finch. Predictably, the all-white jury finds Tom guilty, though he is in fact innocent. And he is killed while attempting to run from the police during the appeal process. Tom Robinson's family is devastated by the murder, and Atticus is angered by the miscarriage of justice born of racial prejudice. In our discussion after the film, 
One of my classmates said, his father had taught him all you need to know about the relationship between people of different races. All you need to know is this, he said, birds of a feather flock together. It's as simple as that. It's the law of nature. This is why in the Archdiocese of Chicago and in every other diocese, we have Polish parishes, Irish parishes, German parishes, Italian parishes, and black parishes. People of similar backgrounds want to live, work, and yes, worship with their own kind. It has always been this way, and it always will be. It's that simple, he said. Birds of a feather flock together. My classmate said nothing at all about the death of Tom Robinson, as if his life did not matter. I have never, ever forgotten that conversation. My background, as Bishop Baker explained, is in systematic theology. And my primary work has been studying the writings of Karl Barth, Bernard Lonergan, Karl Rahner, and other systematic theologians, such as philosophers of religion like Langdon Gilkey, Mircea Eliade, and um, others working in the field. Rudolf Otto has been a particular subject in which I've been interested. So it's really a kind of a strange fate and a strange fortune that I end up pending pastoral letters on the racial divide in the United States. I'm not a sociologist. I'm not a psychologist. In some ways, I'm more comfortable with the tomes of Bernard Lonergan's insight or Rahner's theological investigation than these existential concerns. Nevertheless, this is what I am doing. And so, my reflections this afternoon will have a moving viewpoint in six parts. The first part, the racial divide in the United States. The second part, all lives matter. The third part, the Black Lives Matter movement. The fourth part, the Catholic Church and the Black Lives Matter movement. The fifth part, the churches or the Christian churches and minority groups. And finally, the sixth part, concluding observations. And so it's a reflection that has a moving viewpoint in six parts. The first part, the racial divide in the United States. County Cullen was a brilliant poet of the Harlem Renaissance, and he penned many remarkable poems. One that he penned reflecting on his youth is very appropriate for our gathering this afternoon. It is called Incident. Once riding in old Baltimore, heart filled, head filled with glee, I saw a Baltimorean kept looking straight at me. Now I was eight and very small, and he was no whit bigger, and so I smiled, but he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December. Of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. The undercurrents of the racial divide in the United States have been apparent to all serious observers going back to the time of the civil rights movement spearheaded by the prophetic nonviolent work of the assassinated Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to the present day. Some thought with that movement in the 1960s, the racial divide had come to an end, but that was not the case. Still others, recent commentators, erroneously suggested that with the election of the biracial American president, Barack Hussein Obama, that we suddenly entered into a post-racial era. President Obama, born to Stanley and Dunham of English and German heritage, and her husband, Barack Ka, or later Barack Obama Sr., of Kenyan heritage, seemed a time to embody the racial divide in his own persons, because he lives the tension described by Harvard pioneer W.E.B. Du Bois in The Souls of Black Folk. Some African-American people think that he did not speak enough about racial prejudice and he shouldn't ever mention that he is biracial. He should just be a black man as if his mother did not exist. 
Some white Americans say Mr. Obama sees racism everywhere, and he never stops talking about it. And nevertheless, the racial divide continues even now as he comes to the eighth year of his presidency, and we hear the language, sometimes clear, sometimes subtle, of those seeking to succeed him in the White House. In my first pastoral letter, The Racial Divide in the United States, a reflection on the World Day of Peace 2015, I invited the readers to follow another set of moving viewpoints. First, to imagine how African Americans experience the Christian churches in which, for the most part, you find only European-based religious art. All images of God, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, the saints, and even angels who have no bodies are pictured as if they are all from Europe. Never do they see images of the divine or of the holy in African, Asian, or Hispanic images. I ask them to allow themselves a new awareness of the racial divide in the United States and to think and pray about the ways in which they could work to bring an end to the racial divide. Next, in the pastoral letter, I brought them face to face with a litany of some of the many accounts of the deaths of African-American men in altercation with white law enforcement representatives and the protests around the country and around the world that followed. I then asked them to review the teachings of the Catholic Church on racial relationships, particularly brothers and sisters to us, the historic landmark pastoral letter of the American bishops. I then challenged them to think about the use of terms like minorities and minority groups in the church, in the government, and in the media. Are any Americans really minorities and in minority groups? Are any Catholics or Christians really minority Christians? I asked them to reflect on the value of referring to people not as what they are not, namely not white, but as what they are, African Americans or Asian Americans, not minority groups, and also ask them as Catholics to stop referring to their neighbors who are Baptists or Methodists as non-Catholics. We're never called non-Baptists. We're never called non-Methodists. And finally, I ask them to commit themselves to praying, thinking, listening, learning, and acting in ways that might bridge the racial divide in the United States. Sadly, during this past year, the racial conflict addressed in the racial divide seems to have been exacerbated. The challenges have been made even more acute because of the high visibility of additional violent, often fatal altercations between law enforcement agents and African-American young people. Indeed, I understand that just recently here in Montgomery, Alabama, you had the experience of a man, Gregory Gunn, 58, who was shot to death and accused of murder by a police officer, Officer Aaron Smith, 23. So this conflict seems to go on and on, and this racial divide seems to be made more acute with every passing day by the morning news. In the light of this development, we should not be surprised that we, I as a Catholic bishop, writing and speaking and traveling around the country, hear this question. What do you think about the Black Lives Matter movement? What is the position of the Catholic Church concerning Black Lives Matter? Some voices, black and white, have condemned the Black Lives Matter movement as a violent ideology, urging attacks on police officers, not respecting their dignity and their lives, encouraging the disruption of the daily lives of innocent citizens by blocking traffic on major thoroughfares, closing down places of business, interrupting gatherings of political candidates, and perhaps unwittingly participating in black genocide by the strong support of the right of women to terminate their pregnancies. Other voices have compared the movement to the historic, the historic civil rights movement of the 1960s. Even though the current Black Lives Matter movement's loud, brash, in-your-face tactics may lack the discipline and the clearer focus of that earlier movement. The Black Lives Matter movement has staged more than a thousand protests, like die-ins and shopping malls, which are intended to make everyone aware of the movement's great grievances. In spite of the profound differences and the seeming incompatibility between the teachings of the Christian churches, particularly the Catholic Church, and the Black Lives Matter movement, there may be ways in which the Christian community and the movement might benefit 
from a conversation or from a dialogue. Indeed, Catholics, Christians of other traditions might at the least become better informed about this rapidly growing movement that Time Magazine placed fourth on its list of eight candidates as Person of the Year in December 2015. Part two of the moving viewpoint, all lives matter. Part two, all lives matter. All human beings as conscious subjects, you, myself, we all feel strongly that our lives matter. We know they matter to our families and friends, but we also feel that they should matter to everyone. But every morning's newspaper cries out that in today's world, not everyone embraces this truth. Certainly, from a theological perspective of authentic teachings of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, your life and my life should matter to everyone on this planet. And in the gospel, Jesus of Nazareth teaches us very clearly we must love God with our whole being and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. He teaches this clearly in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so as Christians, all lives should always matter. Many Americans think that should be the end of this question then. All lives matter. Obviously, if all lives matter, then black lives matter. Yet this seemingly obvious truth has not been sufficient as an answer to those whose voices are raised in protest in the Black Lives Matter movement. Why is that? Several supporters of the movement have cited George Orwell's classic novel, Animal Farm, for the answer. They remind us that the mantra of the totalitarian world of the novel is this, all animals are equal. But eventually, the mantra is changed. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Part three of the moving viewpoint, the Black Lives Matter movement. The Black Lives Matter movement began as a hashtag, which became a protest slogan and fueled the internet-driven international protest confronting what its originators and others believed to be indifference to the death of young unarmed black men at the hands of white law enforcement agents. The phrase is more a call to action against racial profiling, police brutality, and racial injustice than a specific organization. The first occurrence of the term Black Lives Matters took place after Mr. George Zimmerman was acquitted in the shooting death of Mr. Trayvon Martin 17, an unarmed African-American youth Four, four years ago on the 26th of February. Mainly women, joined by other activists, created the Black Lives Matter hashtag and social media page. And later, after the death of Mr. Michael Brown Jr., 17, 19, another unarmed African-American youth, after he was fatally shot in Ferguson, Missouri, by Mr. Darren Wilson, a former police officer, and Mr. Eric Garner died at the hands of what some call a police chokehold, the movement gained greater prominence. Demonstrators and marchers around the country and around the world started to shout, hands up, don't shoot, I can't breathe, and Black Lives Matter, to call attention to what was perceived by many people to be the systemic and systematic bias and racial prejudice in the criminal justice system, and particularly in the behavior of some representatives of law enforcement. The complaint is not that all young black men are always innocent of wrongdoing. We all know that this is not true. The complaint is that even when someone has broken the law, they should not be tried, convicted, and executed on the streets. A particularly egregious example of this occurred in Chicago. On October 20th, 2014, Mr. Laquan McDonald, 17, who was armed with a knife, died after being shot 16 times by Chicago police officer Jason Van Dyke. The shooting was videotaped on the police car dashboard camera. However, the video, which showed Mr. McDonald walking away from the officer before the shots were fired, the video was initially not released to the public. The Black Lives Matter movement joined with those expressing anger over what many considered 
a politically motivated delay in releasing the tape. On November 24, 2015, over 13 months after the shooting, the video was finally released for all to see. As a result, the police officer was charged with first-degree murder. And then there were massive protests and demonstrations in downtown Chicago demanding the resignation of Mayor Rahm Emanuel and the dismissal of Police Superintendent Gary McCarthy. The protest expression, Black Lives Matter, then became a dramatic way of calling attention to a reality largely ignored by the larger society. Namely, there are many circumstances in which society seems to operate as if it does not believe that the lives of young men of color really do matter as much as the lives of young white men. The intent of the frequent use of the phrase is to confront the consciences of those who might reply, of course black lives matter because every human life matters. Expressions such as these are perceived by participants in the movement as a way of ignoring the terrible reality that the actions of some police, the decisions of some criminal justice agencies, the activities of many, in many prisons, and efforts to make it difficult for people of color to vote, these strongly suggest that black lives really do not matter, practically speaking, in the day-to-day -day lives of the community. Practically speaking, these lives really do not matter. Nevertheless, some people, some individuals, and some groups chant Black Lives Matter, have used this language to inflame violence against those charged with law enforcement. We heard earlier today of the importance of those who risk their lives every day as police officers, who go out into the street not knowing if they're going to go home to their families. We should show much, such great respect for those who serve the community in this way. But whenever anyone associated with the Black Lives Matter movement encourages attack on police officers, they are rightly condemned because police officers' lives matter. Their lives matter because they are fellow human beings. Significantly, Dr. Ben Carson, the distinguished pediatric neurosurgeon who was, alas, briefly, by a strange fate and stranger fortune, a leading Republican presidential candidate, has argued that many people involved in the Black Lives Movement are misguided. Dr. Carson has singled out the failed public school as a source of African American suffering more than the police, even those who are most brutal as rogue officers. He said African American suffering comes because in our public schools, many teachers are not really teaching our children how to learn. He argues that the actions of these police officers do take black lives one at a time. However, the public school system has destroyed black lives, not in ones and twos, but in whole generations. The failure of public schools do not kill as quickly, but they kill just as surely as bullets do. Black Lives Matter supporters countered Dr. Carson with the argument that, well, his ideas are determined by his age by his social standing, by his conservative Republican ideology, and his strict adherence to his Seventh-day Adventist faith. It is interesting that from the political point of view, Republican politicians and Republican-leaning media are very critical of the Black Lives Matter movement and presume that they do not lose votes because of this posture whereas Democrat politicians and Democrat-leading media are more tolerant of the movement in spite of the podium upstaging tactics that are on the evening news. And knowing that many African Americans do vote as Democrats, they are concerned not to alienate potential supporters. Nevertheless, when the Democratic National Committee endorsed the Black Lives Matter movement, however hesitantly, representatives of that movement declined the endorsement, saying, we don't want to be endorsed by any of you. All politics is corrupt, they said. Fourth, a moving viewpoint. The Catholic Church and the Black Lives Matter movement. There are about 70 million Catholics in the United States. 70 million Catholics a part of a larger Catholic community of 1,300,000,000 Catholics around the world. 
Don't worry, they're not all in church on Sunday. At most, there are only about 3 million African American Catholics. 3 million out of 70 million. There are many dioceses where there are no black Catholics and, and many others where there are only a few. This means that many white Catholics in certain states and in rural communities have virtually no contact with African American Catholics. Many of them experience the Black Lives Matter movement indirectly by way of the media. It is probably not a major presence in the consciousness of most Catholics because they have no contact with people of color in the church. Because African Americans make up such a small portion of the Catholic Church, it may be quite difficult for the church to be able to interact in a significant way with the Black Lives Matter movement. People have long memories of past rejection and discrimination. It is not likely that the number of black Catholics will increase significantly in the near future. Even the aggressive, even if the church were to mount an aggressive evangelization effort, it would probably make only a small inroad in African American communities. Those with long histories of membership in the Baptist Church, in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, are not likely to leave these church families for Catholicism. The growing number of younger African Americans with no church affiliation are not likely to be attracted to the Catholic Church in significant numbers. The barbaric slaughter of the innocent on June 17, 2015 in Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston by 21-year-old Dylan Roof, a white supremacist pictured wrapped in a Confederate flag, horrified many Americans. However, many of those horrified are unaware that the reason why there is an African Methodist Episcopal Church, why it exists at all, is the simple fact that the children of the people who had been enslaved were not allowed to become members of mainline Christian communities, including the Methodists and the Episcopal Church, as well as the Catholic Church. After all, during the era of slavery, Catholic Church members owned human beings themselves. The Jesuits, for example, owned human beings, as well as others. This fact is a part of African-American consciousness. And so a past marred by racial oppression and systematic discrimination cannot be undone by pastoral letters, no matter how heartfelt they may be. The evil of America's original sin of enslaving free human beings, like the evil of the Nazi Holocaust inflicted on the Jewish people, has left a permanent scar on the nation's psyche. As a result, white Christianity lacks a certain credibility to many members of the traditional black churches. Indeed, sadly, I personally know African American Catholics who by their own personal experience within the church believe that black lives matter do not matter in the Catholic church as much as white lives matter in the Catholic church. Historically, the Catholic Church has not been actively engaged in conversation with African-American communities at the level of ideas and major movements with the emergence of black consciousness. While several popes and many Catholics condemn the anti-Christian practice of enslaving human beings to work the lucrative plantations of the South, the larger Catholic community maintain a distance from the abolitionist movement in which the church played no leadership role. In 1889, Daniel Rood initiated a series of black Catholic Congresses. The fifth Congress in Baltimore in 1894 stated, we hope to hail the day when the American people, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church and the laity shall rise up in might and stamp out the prejudice which is today destroying the lifeblood of this country. However, that did not happen. An examination of Catholic journals and periodicals does not suggest that the church was particularly attentive to or in dialogue with the essential black voices in the period, let us say, from the 1910s and 20s during the Niagara Movement and W.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey on up through all the literature to the present day, 
the writings of people like James Baldwin and Lorraine Hansberry and Maya Angelou and so many others, Alex Walker, the list is too long to, to include, the Catholic Church was not a part of that conversation. The essential black voices that were being raised did not create a formal conversation so that statements by the Catholic Church have not been significantly informed by the voices of people of color who were busy articulating the depth and the meaning of the African-American experience. This lack of a history of dialogue underscores the difficulties the church might encounter in seeking to find a genuine conversation with the Black Lives Matter movement. I don't mean to say that the Catholic Church has not been, over periods of time, as I mentioned in my earlier pastoral, very dedicated to bringing an end to racial prejudice through the Catholic Interracial Society and many other movements, especially beginning in the 1950s, 60s, and into the 70s. But even then, sometimes much was said, but not very much was actually done. There are no reliable statistics concerning how many African Americans are actively involved in the Black Lives Matter movement. It is generally to believe that the number is rather small and that the key voices of the movement are those of young people in their 20s and 30s. Many are women. There's also no reliable way to determine how many black Catholics are supportive of the positions espoused by the movement, but I know for a fact that some young black Catholics are sympathetic to some of the issues raised by the movement. My main impression from direct contact is that the movement does not give very much thought to the Catholic Church at all. Movement supporters assume that the Catholic Church does not give much thought to them either. As one put it, we live in different worlds. While there is a degree of awareness of the church's various social, educational, and healthcare ministries that make positive contributions to black communities, the primary impression of some Black Lives Matter movement supporters have the Catholic Church is that the Catholic Church is a very large, white, conservative, mainly Republican institution that stands aloof from the confrontational movements such as Black Lives Matter. It should be noted that many Catholics are actually Democrats. Movement members think that the church is more a part of the problem and not a part of the solution because it has a necessary allegiance to what they call white privilege. The movement sees an incompatibility between itself and the Catholic churches and many Christian churches' moral teachings, which are thought to be out of touch with the times, teachings such as the church's teachings on marriage, rejecting what is sometimes called marriage equality, the argument that people of the same sex should be married, contraception and abortion, women's reproductive justice, women's right to choose, to choose what? To choose to end their pregnancies, which of course is never said, and homosexual activity, gay rights, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender concerns. So they say since the church has these old-fashioned ideas about morality, they cannot see much room for conversation with the, with the Black Lives Matter movement and the Catholic Church. They see the church as a complex bureaucracy tied to the status quo, unwilling and unable to speak the truth to power. As one activist put it, when the church speaks about social justice, it always does so in measured, balanced, reserved, careful, qualified language. It doesn't just shout out, Black Lives Matter. More than that, the Black Lives Matter movement says that they're not so interested in traditional mainline Protestant churches as was the civil rights movement of another era. They're not so much interested in the Jesus who turns the other cheek. They want to talk about the Jesus who confronted the power structures of Rome and of the Jewish community of his time. I had the privilege of being present in the gallery September 24, 2015 of the Congress when His Holiness Pope Francis became the first Roman pontiff in history to address both chambers of the Congress of the United States with remarks that, to the surprise of his listeners, focused not on papal documents or church teachings directly, but on four influential Americans. He focused on the writings of President Abraham Lincoln, the writings of Dorothy Day, the writings of Trappist mystic Thomas Merton, and those of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Each of these writers affirmed in different ways that black lives matter. While President Lincoln's pragmatic political motives for opposing human bondage 
have been idealized, romanticized, and even myth mythologized, his efforts to bring an end to slavery and his Emancipation Proclamation demonstrated an atypical regard for black lives, even though President Lincoln did not equate them with white lives. The Catholic worker founder Dorothy Day was consistently outspoken in her opposition to racist attitudes in America. Her Catholic worker movement was a prophetic movement in its concern for the poor, many of whom, of course, were people of color. In Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander and Letters to a White Liberal, Cistercian Father Thomas Merton wrote searing condemnations of racial prejudice and provided the spiritual and theological foundation for his unambiguous affirmation that black lives matter, if not in those words. And Dr. King, of course, sacrificed his own life for the cause of racial justice. And that still deferred dream that African Americans would be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. By calling to mind the legacies of these four remarkable Americans, not usually referred to in papal addresses, the Bishop of Rome clearly wanted to associate himself with their beliefs that black lives really do matter. Indeed, he wanted to say to the Catholic Church, black lives really do matter. Part five of a moving viewpoint. The Christian churches and so-called minorities or minority groups. John Donne, the great Anglican priest and poet in his devotions wrote these famous words. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind. Therefore, never sin to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. In the United States, we regularly hear expressions concerning the population about minorities, minority groups, minority Catholics, minority Christians, even whether or not on Super Tuesday or some other voting day, which candidate will get the most minority groups voting for them? How many minorities will vote for this candidate? How many minorities will vote for that candidate? Why is that? Though these expressions are regularly used by our government, by our churches, and by the media, I believe that they are radically incorrect and that they exacerbate in so many ways the racial divide in the United States. Sometimes they underscore conflicts between people of different races in our country and in our churches. I've said this many times before. Nobody agrees, nobody accepts my argument, but I believe it is true. Beginning in the 1960s, the media and the federal government and Americans of certain racial and ethnic backgrounds, especially people of color, Hispanics, and Asians, though significantly not every ethnic group, which constitutes a statistically small portion of the population, began to speak more and more about minorities and minority groups in solidarity with women and other groups who have experienced injustice based upon discrimination. Indeed, some have argued that the movement that is sometimes called the same-sex relationship liberation movement took up speed primarily because it associated itself by referring to people of same-sex attraction as simply one more oppressed minority group. These designations were used to help to formulate the argument that in order to redress the grave injustices caused by systemic and systematic prejudice, special consideration should be given to members of these groups in matters relating to education, employment, housing, financial assistance, and professional advancement. It does not take a particularly critical eye to recognize there is certainly a need for this to a certain extent because of past injustices. At the same time, if you look carefully at words like minority, minority groups, you will see they are used quite selectively and they are not applied consistently in reference to all groups of Americans who are statistically a small percentage of the population. For example, 
When you hear in the news that the United States government is developing a new program to assist minorities in America, do you think about people whose ancestors come from Sweden? They are a minority in America. Do you think of people whose ancestors come from Luxembourg? They are minorities in America. Do you think about people whose ancestors come from Ireland or Germany or Poland or France or Italy? They're all minorities in, in America. Why is that? Somehow, somehow, the way this term is used, it refers only to certain people. And the expression sometimes is used as a code word suggesting subtle negative connotations. Poor people, uneducated people, unemployed people, broken family structures, people who may be troublemakers, and the like. It also begs the question, who amongst the American citizens constitutes the majority group? There are no ethnic Americans in the same sense that one might speak about ethnic Japanese in Japan, for example. There is no single ethnic or racial or cultural group that constitutes the true American. Every citizen of the United States is fully and equally an American in the exact same sense of the word. Citizens who are descendants from passengers on the Mayflower are not somehow more truly American than descendants of passengers on the Middle Passage, the Middle Passage of the slave ships, or the most recent immigrant from Syria, or the Native Americans who were granted citizenships by the Congress in 1924. Imagine granted citizenship in their own country. All are Americans. If they are citizens, they are Americans, precisely because there are no ethnic Americans. And a careful reflection on the meaning of the expression e pluribus unum, one from many, excludes the possibility of designating some people as minorities in this country unless all citizens are designated as members of various and different minority groups. How then did this happen? How did this terminology come about? That people who come from other countries, like people from Ireland or Italy, or people who are Jewish, who were once called immigrants, foreigners, undesirable minorities, are not so much, if ever, today. A careful reading of Matthew Fry's Jacobson's remarkable book, Whiteness of a Different Color, European Immigrants and the Alchemy of Race helps us to understand how, with the emergence of the great migration of people of color from the South to escape the Jim Crow laws, to move to cities like Chicago, like New York, like Detroit, like Philadelphia, like Los Angeles, like Cleveland, and St. Louis, and so many others, moving into the areas where the immigrants from Eastern and Western Europe had a stronghold in the various Christian churches, especially Catholicism. They had the jobs, they had the housing, they had the educational opportunities. And suddenly, people who were not really close to one another, in a city like Chicago where I was born, the Irish Catholics, the Polish Catholics, the German Catholics, the Italian Catholics, each their own enclave, suddenly said, we better get together. We're one against them, the onslaught that is coming forth in the uh, Great Migration. And so by a very slow but very real process, all the different ethnic people from Europe became one, the majority, because they are white people, and the people coming from the South, the people of color escaping Jim Crow laws and the ravages of slavery became minority groups moving into their territory, moving into their turf. And as a result, today, even when the majority of the residents of a city are African American or Hispanic Americans, they are still minorities. A couple of years ago, there was an article in one of the leading newspapers speaking about a large city. And it said, by the year 2025, the majority of this population will be made up of a minority. So those people, even though they constitute statistically the largest number of people in the city, they can't be the, the majority. They're still a minority. Very interesting. Words have meaning. Words have meaning, and to me, the way we use the words minority and minority group uh, is not neutral. It is not neutral. Uh, they, they are terms that in some ways can even be associated with the maintaining of the status quo, the maintaining of a kind of white privilege because they primarily name people as what they are not. The minority groups, who are they? they're the ones who are not white, so they're minority. It doesn't take very, I said this once at the meeting of, of the bishops, if you're going to make a statement from the Bishop's Conference, instead of saying, let's adapt this to all the minority groups, we're mainly talking about a very small group of people. 
the African American people, the Asian American people, the Native American people, uh, the Hispanic American people. It's a very small group of people that we're really referring to. We're not talking about the Swedish Americans or the Lutheran Americans or, or the, or the uh, Luxembourg Americans. So we ought to just call people by what they are and not by what they are not. As I said earlier, uh, as Catholics, we would do well to stop calling our brothers and sisters of other Christian traditions non-Catholics. Why would we call Lutherans, Methodists, or Presbyterians, or Episcopalians non-Catholics? They don't call us non-Episcopalians. They don't call us non-Baptists. They don't call us non-Lutherans. Now we know there are historical reasons for that which we will not go into. Significantly, the majority of the world's population is not of European origin, and current demographic trends indicate that in the decades ahead, ahead, Americans of European heritage may become statistically the minority of the country's overall population. Then what shall we do? The Christian churches believe from scripture that in Christ there is neither Greek nor Jew, nor slave nor freeman, neither male nor female. All are redeemed sinners. All are transformed members of the body of Jesus Christ. All, all have equal dignity before God. And perhaps it would be a wonderful thing if the Christian communities were to take some leadership and challenge the public discourse that always refers to people of different backgrounds as minorities and minority groups. Because, and this is not easy to do, because those so designated now self-designate themselves. Because to get contracts, to get benefits of a certain type, you have to say, I'm a member of a minority group, so will I get this? Will I get this part of the pie? And that's understandable. That's understandable, but you think about it, if you think about it, uh, words have a great power for good or evil. Is it asking too much for us as a nation which proclaims itself to be one of many, one from many, is it asking too much to affirm that in truth there are no majority minority groups in our country because we really are one. Yes, we have different histories. People have a proud Irish history, German history, Polish history, Italian history, Spanish history, Jewish history. And people of color have a proud or tortured history that does not lead to, to this country by way of Ellis Island, but by way of the tragedy of the Middle Passage. Hence the term African American, a very odd term. Uh, my friends who live in Nigeria or Kenya or Uganda or South Africa uh, find it very interesting. They would never speak of themselves that way. They might call themselves a Nigerian American or a Kenyan American, uh, but they would never use a whole continent to identify themselves because each of these countries in Africa and each of the language group, ethnic and tribal groups are very, very, very different. And so the term African American has emerged because of the inability to claim a country, even though most of human beings who were bought and sold came from West Africa. So it's an odd neologism in an effort to give a people uh, some type of a name because I think there was a certain tension. Well, the Irish have a name, the Polish have a name, the Germans have a name. And it's interesting that if you look at a newspaper back in the days of the Niagara Movement and the beginning of the NAACP, the newspaper would never capitalize, uppercase, the word Negro. It would just be Caucasians with a capital C and Negro with a lowercase c. And W.E.D. Du Bois begged the newspapers to say, no, 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 there's nothing there to, to uppercase. And to this day, some media will not do it. And in our day, a newspaper will list a group of people and it will say Hispanic Americans with a capital H uh, and it'll have uh, uh, and then it'll have Asian Americans with a capital A and then it'll say black Americans with a lowercase b because that's not a name of a country it's, it's just a word uh, and so many people are but it's being used in the same way of Hispanic as Asian many have campaigned for the New York Times for example to use an uppercase b I've campaigned for the news service of our own bishops' conference to use uppercase Bs when they publish my own writing. I sent it to them with uppercase B, just as I have an uppercase W for white, but when they edit it, they lowercase it in order, in order to maintain the common usage by most editors. But words have meaning, and usage has meaning, and they have great power when they seem to convey haves and have not. If we are all one, all Americans, proud of our amazingly diverse background, with every right to expect and to demand to be treated with equal dignity by the law and in the public square and in the church. By law 
the public square, and in the church. My remarks have a moving viewpoint in six parts. The sixth part is a brief set of concluding observations. The great Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German Lutheran pastor and theologian murdered by the Nazis for his opposition to Adolf Hitler's slaughter of the Jewish people, reminded us that the cost of true discipleship from Jesus Christ requires us to reject cheap grace. We must reject cheap grace. The cheap grace we think we can obtain by going through religious rituals in which our hearts and souls are not involved. God's redeeming grace requires our obedience to his law of love and our concrete actions on behalf of others. St. Paul to the Christians living in Corinth tells us love never fails. Love will not fail if we commit ourselves to heeding these basic imperatives. I believe love will never fail in the Christian community as we face the racial divide, if we are willing to pray, to listen, to learn, to think, and to act. We must pray, really pray. Pray to the Holy Spirit. Pray with our families. Pray at Mass. Pray in our churches. Pray in our synagogues. Pray in our temples. Pray in our mosques. Really pray. Pray for the enlightenment that we need. Pray the rosary as Catholic families once did and now almost never do. Pray in the confessional, the sacrament of reconciliation, which so many Catholics no longer make use of. We must pray, truly pray. We must listen, especially the people who do not think like us, people of different backgrounds. Listen to neighbors or friends of different churches or different races, or even seek them out. If we live in an enclave and everybody's more or less like us, make the effort to find a way to be in conversation with people whose point of view is different from our own. If we're not carrying on that dialogue, that core at core locator, heart speaking to heart, we cannot make progress. To pray, to listen, and to learn. To learn by understanding, standing under the experiences of others, even if they make us uncomfortable. And then we must think, we must ponder in our hearts, turn over in our hearts all the things that we are praying and listening and learning about. Ponder in our hearts. Uh, as Carl Barth used to say, with the, with the Bible in one hand and the morning's newspaper in the other. You know, as I came here, I read an article in the newspaper about your legislature and its recent uh, voting concerning the minimum wage and the controversy that that causes, and that uh, it seemed to be a vote that not only was down racial lines, but even to harken back to the impoverishment of people in the time of slavery. Just, just read it on the plane in the New York Times on my, on my iPad, uh, too with the Bible in one hand, the newspaper in the other hand, to, to pray, to listen, to learn, and to think, to really think, and to even think about the points of view of those that you think are diametrically opposed to your own, like some may feel about the Black Lives Matter movement, in order to understand how can people take this, why would there be a Black Lives Matter movement since it is obvious to everyone that all lives matter? Why is it that some people don't think they really matter? They don't really matter. And finally, to act. We must do something. We must pray. We must listen. We must learn. We must think. And we must act. Now they might say, well, what should I do? I don't know what to do. I don't have much power. I'm not a governor. I'm not a mayor. I'm not a representative. In my, I, don't have, I don't have money. I have no position of influence. Everybody can do something in their concrete situation. Whether they're young people like the students in front of us, or people who have lived longer lives. Even if it's nothing more than working for a conversion of our own hearts. Our own hearts. We all need to be purified in our own personal attitudes. Everybody can do something. And most of us can do more than we actually are doing or than we are willing to do because we're mainly comfortable with our primary world and what is familiar to us. But I believe that these imperatives are critical. They are critical and you cannot leave one of them out. I hope if you remember nothing about what I've said to you this afternoon, you remember that from a Christian perspective, we can confront the racial divide and respond to some of the concerns of the Black Lives Matter movement if we pray, if we listen, if we learn, if we think, and if we act. We must do something. The great Langston Hughes was a contemporary of County Cullen and Claude McKay and so many other giants of the Harlem Renaissance movement. 
And one of his poems, of course, inspired Dr. King for the coda of his Now I Have a Dream address in Washington. This is that poem. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Does it explode? We all must do something. If we do not, remember these words from the old slave song. God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more warnings. The fire next time. Thank you. I have been strictly charged that you must conclude at 2.15, but if someone wants to ask a quick question, I'd be happy to, to try to answer it. It might be easiest if you stand up so we know who you are. If not, anybody have any question? I'm sure it wasn't that clear. I have a statement. A statement. Your books and your literature were very multi-ethnic, uh, very inclusive. We changed from that old books in this diocese to another series. But I do know your book spoke very prophetically and very straight to African American children and other children. I won't use the word minority, other ethnic groups as well. Because minority, when we use that word, Sometimes you are in the majority. <laughs> in the city of Birmingham, we say we are still a minority. <laughs> You're not a minority, you are a majority. That, in other words, we do have little power, <laughs> even though we have big and high positions. So don't get confused with that. But I know your books and your literature, which were taken around of the schools, because when we are teaching, I've always been a proponent, and my ex-pastors here listening to me, of conversion, teaching morals and ethics. I could care less if you know Ten Commandments and you live by none. <laughs> but if you know three, and that child was trying to live by those three, you, you used to speak to that effect to me. That child was trying to be a Christian and trying to live a good life. All right. And I do want to just tell you that I will continue to follow you. I'm in love with your writings. I'm in love with what you do. And you keep me interested in the Catholic Church. Well, Thank that's you. very kind of you. That's very kind of you. Well, th those religion books are actually written by various authors. William H. Sadler publishes them. I am their theological consultant, and I review and edit the books. I don't really write, write the books, but they, we make every effort to make sure that their illustrations are multi-ethnic, multiracial. Yes, please. My name is Noah Lett, and I have a question for you about knowledge. When I used to teach, I was aware that many Catholic children couldn't ask the question they wanted to ask because they were afraid of what other people would say. I'm aware of many white Catholics, non-white Catholics, who are afraid to say what they think and have a genuine conversation because of what people will say. That's racist. How dare you? And on and on it goes. How do you create an environment where people can say what they think and not what they're supposed to say just because they're white or because they're black but they happen to not be democratic or whatever? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very real question, but it's not undoable. Key is creating the right environment. 
we had a series of discussions in my diocese and other dioceses on my pastoral letter, my first one in small groups of 8, 10, 12 people, sometimes, sometimes the first time ever that some of the suburbanites ever sit down with some of the people living in the city of different races. You have to create an environment of welcome and hospitality. You have to have a person who has the skills of a facilitator sometimes. And you have to say up front, this is a conversation amongst Christians of people who love God, who love their neighbor. And so for us to go forward, we must be willing to hear, to listen, to what anyone has to say without judging them, even though their point of view may be totally different from ours because we cannot understand them without hearing them and create an atmosphere. And someone has to, you almost sometimes would say, there's no such thing as a wrong question. There's no such thing as a wrong answer. If someone challenges someone saying, I completely disagree with you, uh, I think that's wrong, that's perfectly acceptable. As long as it's done in an attitude of people who are loving one another in Christ, and disagreeing respectfully. Sometimes people are afraid to say what they think because they think they're going to be pounced upon or harshly judged. That's not helpful because this is a long road. This conversation is a long, long road. Uh, but I know exactly what you're talking about, which is why many people who socialize together never talk about the things I've talked about. They have very pleasant, cordial relationships and work with people of different races and backgrounds or colleagues, but they never talk about this at all because it's thought to be too volatile. You know, it's thought to be, but it really should not be if our foundational position is we love God with our whole being, we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. All right, I know you must conclude, so I think I'm going to leave you, but if someone wants to talk to me afterwards, I would be, be happy to as long as I get to my plane on time, which is at 4 o'clock, I think. So again, I'm very happy that you are doing this. Many places around the country are doing similar things. This is one of the best. I certainly appreciate all of you, especially the bishop who has made this possible, and it's very good to be with you. May God continue to bless you and give grace to you all in your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Braxton. And And we thank you for modeling an honest conversation for us here in, in Birmingham. Uh, he and I come from a tradition, a time of studying theology when symbol was uh, very much at the forefront of a theological discussion. Symbols do matter. The language we pick, the language we choose certainly makes a difference. And we'll take uh, that message from him along with others that he gave us today. Thank you very, very much. God bless. Safe trip back to Belleville. I'm just going to have you stand for a moment and then we'll move on to the next part of our uh, open-ended discussion and conversation. God bless you.